Well, tonight we're going to look at Deuteronomy 9 again. And we're looking at the section where Moses is recounting the series of rebellions that were taking place in the wilderness. And, you know, the Bible is a very different history than the books that most people write about history because it tells the bad, not just the good. You know, the enemies, for instance, of the Adventist Church, <coughs> If they write a book, they may tell a lot of bad things about the Adventist Church. If we write a book about our church, we tell all the good things. But the Bible tells both. And I believe one of the reasons why God records the bad is that He is hoping that we will not repeat it again. And if we don't, I realize where we failed, then for sure we'll do it again. And unfortunately, uh, the Adventist Church has done the same things that the Israelite nation did, in spite of the fact that it's all recorded. But at least God did his part. He did what he could to try to keep us from making those mistakes. So we're on <clears throat> verse uh, 20, let's see, 22, chapter 9, verse 22. And he just lists quickly some names, and at Tabera, and at Massa, and Kibroth Hataba, ye provoked the Lord to wrath. And we looked at uh, one of them and started on the other one. Here's a couple more comments on the second one, Massa, where they complained that they didn't have water. And we're on page 69 in the book. Um, they complained that they didn't have water. And uh, so in the Bible Echo of December 1, 1893, it says, they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? And now, this is really serious rebellion. I mean, how many times God had shown his strength on their behalf? Even in Egypt, over and over again, he had done it. He brought them through the Red Sea, an incredible experience, and various other things had happened already by this time. And here they are saying, the fact that we don't have water makes us think that God is not with us. Instead of thinking, well, God has a plan here. Let's wait and trust Him for the plan. And you know, I'm afraid that we do a lot of the same complaining until we learn the lesson. I remember when I was asked to start an institution up in New Hampshire. And of course, uh, there wasn't much money and our businesses weren't really uh, going very well yet. And so there was a constant uh, concern. Are we going to be able to pay our bills? And when I started out, you know, I, I'll have to say I, I did worry about it. I, I'm sure I did some complaining uh, about it, but because the Lord was so regular with bringing the money to be able to pay those bills, pretty soon I changed my attitude and I said, it's going to be interesting to see how God works out this problem. And he always did. He always worked it out. Other people would get all worried, but I didn't worry because God had so many times He had demonstrated His power on our behalf. And uh, I got labeled the eternal optimist, but, you know, it was simply looking at what God had been doing. 
But sad to say, they did not really think about that. In this, the children of Israel manifested the most decided unbelief in God, who had given them every evidence that he was among them, and that he was able and willing to fulfill his promises to them. You know, if we face sickness, can we trust God? We just had a member die, you know, from cancer. And can people trust when he doesn't deliver, when he doesn't heal? That's the question. But never should we ask, is God with us? Is he, is he aware of what I'm going through? And is he uh, doing what he ought to do? We never have to question that. Because... He never makes a mistake. And he's always watching out for us. <clears throat> Afterward, instruction was given them to this effect. So, uh, after this experience, God gave them a direct command. And here's what he said. Ye shall not tempt the Lord your God as ye tempted him in Massa. He says, you're not to do that anymore. Don't question whether I'm among you. I've given you plenty of evidence that I'm among you. And we have that as Adventists. I mean, Adventists have a long list of miracles that God has done all through the history of the Adventist church. Is God among us? Absolutely, he's among us. I don't think he's very happy about some things that are going on. Uh, at our Youth for Jesus site for next year, I just talked to uh, the call porter that's up there, and he went to a meeting in the church, and they were doing rap music. He said, what? He said, that's what I came out of. He said, why in the world are we helping this church? And so I tried to help him to see that, well, we were there to enlighten some people and try to help them see you know, some different things. But then he's saying, well, is God going to bring people into this church? Is he, are we going to get baptisms when they come in and they, they're hearing that kind of thing? Well, that's up to the Lord. If, if there are people that uh, he sees can come in and not lose their way out of it, why, he can do it. But our job is to do things the right way, and the rest has to be up to God. Also, in Patriarchs and Prophets 298, it says, In their thirst the people had tempted God, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? If God has brought us here, why does he not give us water as well as bread? He'd already performed the miracle of giving food. So why couldn't they trust water? The unbelief thus manifested was criminal. And Moses feared that the judgments of God would rest upon them. And he called the name of the place Massa, which means temptation, and Meribah, which means chiding, as a memorial of their sin. So whenever they passed that way in the future and they saw the name of that place, they were to be reminded, don't do that. And of course, the story is in the Bible, so we won't do that. And yet, how many people are doing it? And so God is calling us away from that. Uh, and it was the prayers of Moses that protected those people. And it's the prayers of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary that protects us from destruction when we do those kind of things. And the third one was Kibroth Hata, Hataba. The record of that is in Numbers 11, verses 4 to 34, but I did some skipping uh, to get the main part of the story. 
Numbers 11, 4 through 34. The mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. Now the mixed multitude were Egyptians that were so convinced of the power of the God of Israel they wanted to go with the Israelites out of Egypt. And unfortunately, they became the source of all of the wrong suggestions, or I should say most. Most of the wrong suggestions came from the mixed multitude. Does the Adventist church have a mixed multitude? Yes, we do. Anyone that's an Adventist but is not converted is still a part of the mixed multitude. And they will often make suggestions in church boards and in business meetings and other uh, places that we cannot listen to. We cannot follow that advice. And uh, hopefully there's enough people that are converted who recognize, no, that's not what we should do. And here's the reason why. We shouldn't do it. Uh, but as we look at this, notice what they were wanting. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? So it started with a mixed multitude, but the Israelites also got into the mood of wanting flesh to eat. Now, I think it was last week we read a quote that indicated the children of Israel had lived on a pretty spare diet. You know, they didn't have a big variety. It was the mixed multitude that had all this uh, food that their heart could desire. And so they started complaining, and Israel joined in to the complaints because probably in Egypt they wished they had it and they couldn't have it. So now they wanted it too. We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely. The cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all beside this manna. Now, it's kind of like saying, you remember that there were different names that were given to manna. One was called angel's food. And so here they were complaining about angel's food. The food that the angels were happy to eat, but they didn't like it because their taste buds were corrupted with things that they shouldn't really want. The Lord said unto Moses, Say thou unto the people, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow, and ye shall eat flesh. This is now verse 18. So God gives a message. He says, Okay, you want meat? You will get it. You know, there's a principle, it's pointed out in the book of Ezekiel. We need to be careful what we want, because God will give us what we want. Even if it's bad for us, He'll give it to us. If we really want it, and we clamor for it, He'll give it to us. What it, why does He do that? He's trying to help us understand you shouldn't have asked for that. And there's always a, a consequence that happens because of it. You know, that's one of the big sources of cancer is the eating of meat. And so when we don't like the vegetarian diet that he gave us and we want to eat meat, he says, well, you can have it if you want it. But you get cancer and a lot of other things as well as a result of that. For ye have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Who shall give us flesh to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you flesh, and ye shall eat. So the Lord kind of pokes a little at them, and he says, You thought you had it good in Egypt? 
You know, you think you had it better there than you do here, okay? We'll give you the meat. <laughs> Ye shall not eat one day, nor two days, nor five days, neither ten days, nor twenty days, but even a whole month until it come out at your nostrils and be loathsome unto you because ye have despised the Lord which is among you and have wept before him saying, Why came we forth out of Egypt? Now, I didn't put in, uh, you know, the Spirit of Prophecy comments on this story because it's fairly lengthy. There's quite a bit of material on this, these rebellions. But <clears throat> as we look particularly at this, we learn that uh, they had been deprived of meat for a period of time. And so once they could get it, they were absolute gluttons, a lot of them. And, and they just ate and ate until they vomited. What he means here, it comes out your nostrils, it means you, they vomited. They ate, they gorged themselves so much on this. Down to verse 31. And there went forth a wind from the Lord, and brought quails from the sea, and let them fall by the camp, as it were a day's journey on this side, and as it were a day's journey on the other side. So you could walk for a whole day and and not get to the end of the quail. <coughs> Round about the camp, and as it were, two cubits high upon the face of the earth. Now, this is a very strange. They came in, flying in at about six feet off the ground. So, you know, all they had to do is stand up and whack them and, and kill as many of them as they could kill. And the people stood up all that day and all that night. They were so eager to get that meat. They worked around the clock, 24 hours, to gather as much as they could. And all the next day, and they gathered the quails. He that, had, he that gathered least gathered ten omers, and they spread them all abroad for themselves round about the camp. Now, here is a special group. It wasn't everybody. And while the flesh was yet between their teeth, ere it was chewed, the wrath of the Lord was kindled against the people, and the Lord smote the people with a very great plague. So there were people that died instantly as soon as they took that meat because they were the leaders of that rebellion against God. He gave them the quail, but their life ended. Yes? I wonder if we might misunderstand that word breath. Don't think God loses patience like we do. No. But circumstances require a response. Well, we call it righteous indignation when God is angry. And there's a lot of times in the Bible where it mentions that God was angry, but it's never a selfish anger. It's always anger because people are destroying other people. And he doesn't, he's not happy with that, for people to destroy other people. He's not even happy if we destroy ourselves. You know, he's angry that we have, that we are destroying ourselves. Then it says, And he called the name of that place Kibroth Hatava, because there they buried the people that lusted. So there were thousands of people that died. Every one of these rebellions, thousands of people died. And yet, the ones that were left alive, it seems like they didn't learn, and they rebelled at another time and more of them died. Until finally, none of the ones that came out of Egypt who were over 20 years old, when they came out, none of them were alive, except for Caleb and Joshua, and of course even Moses, and Aaron died before going into Canaan. So, you know, it was basically only Caleb and Joshua that went in to the land of Canaan out of all of those 
Two million people that came out of Egypt. Incredible. You would think that we would really learn our lesson out of this. Okay, going back to our chapter, verse 23, he brings up another one. Likewise, when the Lord sent you from Kadesh Barnea, saying, Go up and possess the land which I have given you. Then ye rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God, and ye believed him not, nor hearkened to his voice. And when you read the story, they rebelled twice. God said, go up and you will conquer the land. And he had said, you won't need to fight. You know, you will be able to conquer that land. And they said, no, we're not going. It's too scary. So then he said, okay, then you're going back to the wilderness. And they said, no, we're not. We're going in and we're going to conquer the land. But the very first battle, they got whipped really bad. And so they were forced to do what God said, to go back into the wilderness. This is uh, recorded in Numbers 14. And we'll just read a little bit of it again without a lot of extra detail. Numbers 14, 1 through 4, All the congregation lifted up their voice and cried. And the people wept that night. Oh, we've been expecting to go into the land of Canaan all the time in Egypt and during the journey, and now we're here. And oh, it's impossible. We can't go in. So they wept all night. Now, going into Canaan, I believe, is to tell us what has to happen for us to enter the heavenly Canaan. And if we think we can't conquer Satan, and we can't conquer our weaknesses of character, then we're going to moan and groan just like them, and we're going to say we can't do it. It's not possible for us to conquer. But it was possible for them, and that was demonstrated later, 40 years later, that they were able to conquer all their enemies, and they could have done it sooner, but, uh, and so can we. And yet some people today are even trying to tell us, you don't have to conquer. It's not necessary. It's like saying to the Israelites, you don't have to go in Canaan. It's okay, we, we got another place over here where you can go. No, God said you're to go in Canaan. He has said to us, you're to enter heaven and we can conquer everything by his power that it takes to enter the heavenly Canaan. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt? Or would God we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword, and that our wives and our children should be a prey? See, they were really worried about their children. Oh, my, our children are going to get killed. Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, Let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. Where's Aaron going to Egypt? Well, fortunately, because of Moses, Aaron was on the right side this time. But, you know, uh, he wasn't at Sinai. Now, what does it mean when people say, or how, let me put it this way, how do people say today, let's return to Egypt? You know how it is? Whenever God has said, this is what you should not do, or what you should do, and people say, no, I want to do what the world does. They're saying, 
we like Egypt better than God's plan. And there's a lot of ways people are doing that today. Music, uh, drama, entertainment, dress, diet, and we could go through quite a few more things that people are saying we like Egypt better. And so God is trying to get his people to appreciate the way it's going to be in heaven. You know, if we eat like they eat in heaven, and we dress like they dress in heaven, and we leave off the things that they don't do up there in heaven, then we're going to be able to enjoy it when we get there. Otherwise, we'll be looking around and saying, Where, where's the ping pong table? You know, there's no ping pong table up here. What am I going to do? Or whatever, you know, it is that they long for. <clears throat> Numbers 14 also, if you go down to verse 26. The Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Say unto them, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. So God said, okay, that's what you want? Or that's what you're worried about? Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, from 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me, and you go down, verse 31. But your little ones, which ye said should be a prey, them will I bring in, and they shall know the land which ye have despised. Well, what does that mean? From what I've read in the spirit of prophecy, what that means is that most Seventh-day Adventists will lose out, I mean those that are Adventists now, will lose out on eternal life. The vast majority will lose out. Who's going to go in? The Baptists, the Methodists. Oh, they won't stay Baptists. They won't stay Methodists. They're going to become Sabbath keepers. And they're going to go in. It's like they're the children now. See, they don't know all the things that we know. But later they're going to learn. And they're going to go in and conquer uh, their sins. And they're going to be overcomers. And they're going to go in the kingdom. And those that wouldn't go in because they didn't think it was possible, they miss out. That's why these stories are in there, trying to help us realize what is the history of God's people in the last days? What, what is it going to be like? That's the way it's going to be like. So one thing I feel we need to pay attention to, number one, don't do things just because other people are doing them. And don't worry if they make fun of you or think you're strange because uh, they may not be heading to the same place you are. So just uh, follow what God says and don't worry about what others are doing. Now he sums it up in verse 24. The whole history so far of the children of Israel. He says, Ye have been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. Moses says, From the moment that I came in by God's direction to lead the children of Israel out, he says, There's one thing I have to recognize is that it's been one rebellion after another. One rebellion after another. If you were to study carefully the history of the messages that God has brought to the Adventist church, each message has been rejected in general. Not by everybody, praise God. There's always a remnant that accept. But when God brought the message about health, that was the first one because he knew if we lived healthfully that our minds would be clear to recognize the rest. But in general, the health message has been rejected. 
And then, I don't know the exact sequence of these different messages, but he brought in the message on educational reform. And most people rejected, most schools rejected the council about educational reform. And he brought in uh, organizational reform. How, how does a Christian organization actually operate? And that was not uh, loved by everybody. And on and on we can go. That many powerful messages have been brought and God has to say the same. They rebelled from the beginning until now. Verse 25. Well, let's see. I got a, a one quote here. Third Testimonies, page 319 on verse 24. Moses was the meekest man that lived. Yet because of the murmurings of the children of Israel, he was repeatedly compelled to bring up their course of sin after leaving Egypt and to vindicate his course as their leader. So this is just one of those times when he was doing it. But apparently he had to do this frequently. Just before leaving Israel, when he was about to die, he rehearsed before them their course of rebellion and murmuring since they had left Egypt and how his interest and love for them had led him to plead with God in their behalf. <coughs> we can be very thankful that Jesus is pleading for us in the heavenly sanctuary. If he wasn't, I think the Adventist church would have been destroyed by now. But Jesus is pleading. And uh, there is a remnant that are willing to do what God asked them to do. And to take correction when they find out that they're on the wrong path. And he said, no, this is not the path you should be on. And so because of that, it's just like in Sodom. If there had been ten righteous people, he wouldn't have destroyed Sodom. And I'm not saying the Adventist church is Sodom by saying that. But that's just an example that righteous people preserve organizations. And so they become very, very valuable. Often they're attacked by many people in the organization. But what those people don't realize is that the preservation is taking place partly because of those faithful ones that are practicing what God called them to do. Not in a legalistic way, not to earn any favor with God, but because they feel that God has done so much for them, the least we can do is to do what He says. And then not only do what He says because He said it, but there is a benefit that God wants us to get. And so, you know, it's not wrong to enjoy the benefit from obedience. <clears throat> Moses presented before them their sins and said to them, Ye have been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. He related to them how many times he had pleaded with God and humbled his soul in anguish because of their sins. And I've mentioned this before, but in Ezekiel, the ones that will be saved in the end are the ones that have sighed and cried for the abominations that have been done in the Adventist church. They're not criticizing the people. They're not running them down. But they're doing exactly what Moses did. They're saying, Lord, please wake them up. Help them to see that this is a blessing to do this. And pleading that God will spare His people a little longer to give them a chance to be woken up and to follow the instruction. Those are the ones that are going to be saved in the end. So be careful. You know, there's a conservative 
element in the Adventist church that's very critical. And if you listen and read their stuff very much, you'll get to where you, you become critical also. I used to get some of their materials and I was reading it and there was a lot of good things in it, but I began to wake up to the fact that it destroys your attitude and you become very critical. Going on, verse uh, 25. Thus I fell down before the Lord forty days and forty nights as I fell down at the first, because the Lord had said he would destroy you. So two times Moses spent forty days pleading for the children of Israel. And there were other occasions where it was short, you know, he went to the sanctuary and he pled for them that God would spare them. And so he's just reminding them of how much he prayed for them. Verse 26, I prayed therefore unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, destroy not thy people and thine inheritance, which thou hast redeemed through thy greatness, which thou hast brought forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand. It's the same as that uh, gardener, you know, in the New Testament where the command was given, cut that tree down, it doesn't have any fruit, cut it down. And the gardener said, please, let me dig around it and put some manure on it. And then if it doesn't uh, yield the fruit, then, then you can cut it down. Well, that gardener was Jesus, and he, he is pleading, don't cut that tree down yet. You know, give, give it some more opportunity. And then verse 27, remember thy servants. So these are the arguments that Moses used in prayer. And they're good arguments. Remember thy servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He said, Lord, you promised Abraham. You promised Isaac. You promised Jacob. Don't forget the promise that you made. These people are rebellious, but Abraham and Isaac and Jacob were not. And you promised them. You see, this, this is what God wants us to do. Plead the promises of the Bible. Any promise that is in there is for us to plead like Moses did. And so he took those promises to Abraham, to Isaac and Jacob, and he said, Lord, you can't destroy these people. Look not unto the stubbornness of this people nor to their wickedness, nor to their sin. Three different ways of looking at it. What's the problem? They were stubborn. They wouldn't do what God asked them to do. You know, some people are like that. You give a, a request or a, even a command and they don't want to do it, so they won't do it. They're stubborn. And so that's the way the people were generally. They were stubborn. Also, uh, not only were they stubborn, but what they did was wicked and sinful. In Second Bible Commentary, page 1016, it was Saul's stubbornness that made his case hopeless. And yet, how many venture to follow his example. God can't heal stubbornness. I mean, he can heal it if we say, Lord, take away my stubbornness. <clears throat> but if we won't give it up, he can't save us. It's not possible. And so with Saul, if he had woke up and said, you know, I shouldn't be going against what God said. I, sh I should confess my sin of keeping Agag and these other things. If he had done that, he could have been forgiven, but he was so stubborn, he wouldn't admit that he'd done anything wrong. 
and deserve ages 62 and 3. If the reports brought by the shepherds and the wise men were credited, they would place the priests and rabbis in a most unenviable position, disproving their claim to be the exponents of the truth of God. So when the angels told the shepherds the place where Jesus was born, and they found him there. They went and told everybody. And the, all the leaders of Israel heard the story. But their stubbornness rose up. And they said to themselves, If it was really the Messiah, he would have told us. He wouldn't have told shepherds. And so they wouldn't pay attention. And what they were worried about was their own reputation. If what these shepherds turns, uh, say turns out to be true, then people are going to look at us and say, well, why weren't you the ones that tell us? And so they're worried about their loss of reputation. These learned teachers would not stoop to be instructed by those whom they termed heathen. That's a reference to the wise men. They thought, well, those people are heathen. God wouldn't tell them and not tell us when the Messiah is here. It could not be, they said, that God had passed them by to communicate with ignorant shepherds or uncircumcised Gentiles. They determined to show their contempt for the reports that were exciting King Herod in all Jerusalem. So they cast reflection on those stories. Don't... Daniel had told them and Micah told them too. That's right. <coughs> they would not even go to Bethlehem to see whether these things were so. Isn't that amazing? They wouldn't even check it out. <coughs> and they led the people to regard the interest in Jesus as a fanatical excitement here began the rejection of Christ by the priests and rabbis. <clears throat> From this point, their pride and stubbornness grew into a settled hatred of the Savior. Could that ever happen again? I believe it will happen. I read one quote that really uh, set me back a little but I can see that it's true especially when you look at history that when God really blesses a man and helps him do a powerful work for God nine times out of ten he loses his way that was written to Kellogg and we know he lost his way he was one of the most willing people to do what Ellen White was shown by God that we should do as a people. Along with Sutherland, McGann, and a number of others that were of the same mind. But <clears throat> he became proud with all the success that he had with people from all over the world uh, coming to his place and you know, worshiping him as an amazing doctor. And so we, we are in for some of the same kind of things. If it's true, if you can read it in the Bible and Spirit Prophecy and it's true, don't worry who won't accept it or who casts reflection on it. It, there's, they're just doing the same thing that the Jewish leaders did. And the prime example of that is 1888. The next one comes from 1888 Materials, page 846. You write that you have said that you would not, you would have not controversy with Sister White. <coughs> Better, far better, have had this controversy openly than undercover. 
For this controversy has been, and there has not been harmony between us since the Minneapolis meeting. In other words, they did not stand in the pulpit and criticize the White's ministry, but they did it privately to people, cast reflection upon what she said. You have been exceedingly stubborn, and this stubbornness has been as described in the Word of God. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice, <clears throat> and to hearken than the fat of rams. It's like saying, it's better to do what God said than give a huge offering. You know, millions of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars. God cares more about obedience than he does the offering that people give. This stubbornness, my dear brother, can be brought under control only by your falling upon the rock and being broken. See, we have two choices. Falling on the rock and have all that stubbornness, selfishness, and all that stuff broken up, smashed to pieces, or the rock's going to fall on us and grind us to powder. Those are the two choices. It is a terrible snare to you. It makes you unwilling to confess your wrongs. And every wrong passed over without humble confession will relieve you and Elder Butler. So this is uh, to Uriah Smith, who was the editor of the Review and Herald. I mean, we're talking about people that were high up. Butler was the general conference president. And they were criticizing Ellen White because of their stubbornness. Uh, without humble confession will relieve you and Elder Butler and every soul who pursues the same course in blindness of mind and hardness of heart. We'll stop there for tonight. <laughs> well, I think he, he did a lot better, uh, although I understand he wouldn't sign the anti-meat pledge in spite of the fact that Illinois White was calling for him to do it so that others would, would be willing to sign the pledge. So, you know... Uh, Unfortunately, the record is, is not the best. But if we learn from it and we're willing to fall on the rock and have all the resistance to what God says smashed out of us to where whatever he said, whether it makes sense or not, we're willing to follow it, then we can get away from this stubbornness and rebellion and so on. Because it's in all of our hearts. You know, we're no different than anybody else. We all have the same problem.